Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Setting the Stage, Unpacking the Data on High Quality After School Arts Programs, hosted in partnership with the Forum for Youth Investment. I'm Sean Gray, Senior Manager of Production at the After School Alliance, and I'll be your moderator for this webinar. Today, we'll be looking at how professional teaching artists, high quality equipment, and dedicated welcoming art spaces can make a difference for after-school programs interested in embedding arts learning in their programs. This webinar is based on setting the stage, practical ideas for implementing high quality after-school arts programs, a report conducted by Research for Action and McClanahan Associates, Inc., and commissioned by the Wallace Foundation. First, we'll hear from the report's researchers, Wendy McClanahan, PhD of McClanahan Associates, Inc., and Tracy Hartman, PhD, from Research for Action, who will unpack some of the data and recommendations for us. Next, Amy Chico of the Boys and Girls Club of the Tennessee Valley will share her experience implementing the Youth Arts Initiative programs with her students. After Amy, I'll share some resources available for programs to use in our online program toolkit. And finally, Tiffany Walker from the Forum for Youth Investment will share some of the tools and research her team has been working on. We'll have a brief Q&A period to wrap up the webinar. Now I'll pass the mic over to Tracy and Wendy to share their presentation. Thanks so much, Sean. Tracy and I are really happy um, to be with uh, all of you today and just saw, you know, lots of folks um, saying where they're from in the chat and so welcome. And like Sean said, we're going to share some high level findings from our research on the Youth Arts Initiative, um, which can be found in the report setting the stage practical ideas for implementing high quality after school arts programs. We're going to start with some background on the Youth Arts Initiative and um, then we are going to share some more details about the study. Then we'll present high level findings followed by a sample of specific approaches that YAI sites use to increase the quality of their arts programs. We won't be able to go through all of the approaches today, but we plan to share a few. Next slide, please. Research shows that arts are a spark or a motivating passion for many young people. And they also offer opportunities for young people to develop interests and skills that will help them creatively engage in economic and civic life. But unfortunately, far few uh, young pe far too few young people whose family incomes are below the federal poverty line have access to these types of programs, either inside or outside of school. In fact, compared to youth from young youth from families with incomes above poverty level, youth from families with incomes below poverty level are about half as likely to have access to these types of programs. Cuts in school-based arts education are um, one contribution to this inequity, but arts programming outside of schools is also inaccessible for many young people because it can be too expensive, might not be located in places that young people from under-resourced communities can get to easily. And when arts are offered in low-cost, geographically accessible settings, such as after-school arts programs that don't, spoke, uh, don't um, focus specifically on the arts, programming is often focused on arts and crafts rather than creating original artwork and developing formative artistic skills. Next slide, please. So the Youth Arts Initiative or YAI was developed to generate lessons for the field about how to increase access to quality of and equity in arts education in an after-school setting for young people whose family incomes are below the federal poverty line. The Wallace Foundation funded the Boys and Girls Clubs of America and I saw some folks um, from there here today. And they're an organization that has an existing national network of out of school time um, organizations, which reaches children and teens from communities that have been economically and socially marginalized, who don't have access to high quality art skill development experiences to develop a high quality art program for tweens and teens. BGCA is committed to arts and has the footprint to take these YAI programs to scale. From 2014 to 2018, three of BGCA's affiliates tried to implement YAI. They were successful in creating high quality art programs, but they also faced challenges because some aspects of YAI 
um, were not aligned with their operations and because BIAI required more costly infrastructure to implement, sustain, and scale across their sites as compared to arts and crafts programs. So in 2009, with startup resources from the Wallace Foundation and a matching grant requirement, BGCA asked five more affiliate organizations to test out approaches for increasing the quality of the arts programs using YAI principles with scaling and sustainability in mind. Next slide, please. In YAI, high quality arts programming is defined by the 10 principles for success, which are described in the report, Something to Say, which you can find on Wallace Foundation's website, along with other reports on the Youth Arts Initiative. So go check it out. And these principles were derived from interviews with more than 200 teens and their families, from art program directors, researchers, other experts. Um, and they serve as a guide to developing and improving after school arts programming. The research that was done revealed that what youth want from an arts program is to be taught by a professional artist. They want spark a space for the arts that belongs to them and affirms their engagement in the arts. They want safety to express themselves creatively. And they wanna have genuine hands-on experiences creating artwork of their own with high quality current equipment and materials. Next slide, please. So in addition to providing startup funds for the five organizations to test out approaches for improving the quality of their arts programs and creating a sustainable infrastructure for the arts, the Wallace Foundation also funded research on the effort so that other programs can learn from the experiences of these organizations. So the Setting the Stage report includes findings and recommendations for leaders of OST organizations that offer multiple different types of programs for youth and are trying to improve the quality of their arts programs or to start new high quality arts programs. And I'm gonna turn it over to Tracy, who's gonna provide more information about YAI in the study. Okay, you can go to the next slide and then the slide after that. Great. Okay, so there were five boys and girls clubs that participated in the Youth Arts Initiative research. And the organizations were, um, medium to large size organizations. You can see in the table that they operated between 17 and 36 sites. The YEI initiative though was intended to be implemented in a small subset of sites so that new approaches to elevating the quality of arts programming could be developed and tested. And so the organizations implemented YEI in between three to seven sites in their network. All right, so the organizations implemented y YAI across multiple art forms, and these art forms were often selected with youth interests and youth input. Um, the art forms fell into three broad categories, performing arts, which included dance, theater, uh, and instrumental music, digital arts, which included graphic design, photography, film, digital music, and then visual arts, which included painting, drawing, pottery, et cetera. Next slide. However, as um, they were a year into testing these new models, the COVID-19 pandemic hit and the organizations had to change their approaches. From March of 2020 through June of 2021, four, uh, four of the Boys and Girls Clubs used a variety of virtual and hybrid approaches to implement the arts programming, but the arts programming did continue. Um, and then a fifth club uh, remained in person and continue to offer arts programming to children of essential workers. But this meant that they often were serving some youth that were younger than initially intended for the YAI initiative. So there were some disruptions to the way the YAI program was implemented. And because of this, we were not able to observe the full arc of program development. Um, but the foundations of the program had been laid by the time the pandemic began and the research was able to continue to follow the program and see how it evolved through June of 2021. Next slide. So a little bit more about the research itself. Um, it took place from January of 2019 through June of 2021. Prior to the pandemic, we were able to conduct in-person uh, site visits, two of them where we conducted interviews and focus groups. Um, observed the majority of, of YAI programs. And then once the pandemic began, we continued to collect data, though we did it virtually. Um, we also were conducting quarterly calls with key staff throughout the entire um, initiative. We collected wage and labor data, participation data, and then we also reviewed YAI plans and documents. 
Next slide. So um, before we move on to the findings of the study, I wanna come back to the 10 principles again. <clears throat> so these uh, principles, which define quality, they're, they're the sort of the definition of high quality um, arts in this initiative, suggest approaches to delivering arts programming that differ from how um, out of school time programs that offer multiple types of programs often um, deliver arts programming. For example, the three of the quality principles, the ones that are um, darker uh, and darker coloring on this slide, Describe the infrastructure that's needed to support artistic skill development, which is not typically found in many out of school time programs that offer multiple types of programming. And so this infrastructure includes staffing by teaching artists who can mentor youth as artists. It includes having the latest high quality tools and equipment to learn art skills. And it includes near professional, dedicated and inspiring studio spaces that have the functionality that's needed to learn the art form safely and effectively. And these principles, uh, as the infrastructure, they support the implementation of all the other principles. Uh, for example, teaching artists can hold high expectations for skill development and support youth creative expression in ways that staff that don't have the content expertise they bring maybe may not be able to do. So the, and these principles are also important for youth engagement. Um, in previous research, we heard that having new equipment and spaces, new studio spaces created a buzz in the club that drew young people to the arts program, young people that had not previously um, explored the arts uh, to come out and try new art forms. But these three infrastructure principles are the most costly. And so decisions about these three principles and how to implement them rose to the surface when club leaders were thinking about their models and thinking about how to make them sustainable and scalable. So the findings of the research that we're going to present in the next few slides are gonna focus on these three principles. And I'm gonna turn it back to Wendy. Thanks. Next slide, please. Um, so now we're going to turn to some early lessons learned that were common. So these are lessons that are common across all five uh, organizations um, that they use to increase the quality of their arts programming. Next slide, please. So the first lesson was that all five organizations prioritized the use of teaching artists. They chose to staff the vast majority, if not all, of their YAI art classes with teaching artists. And this is really significant because teaching artists were often paid a higher salary than the organization's other frontline staff. Teaching artists were responsible for implementing many of the other quality principles and were able to mitigate some of the challenges when the space and equipment, the other infrastructure principles, were not ideal. So for example, when students had to share equipment, Skilled teaching artists were able to construct lesson plans that kept all participants busy and engaged. Youth were attracted to working with the teaching artists and really appreciated the high expectations that they had for them in their artwork. And you can see a quote on this slide from one of the young people. And then finally, even though some of the organization leaders had questions about the value of teaching artists at the start of their YAI experience, by the end of the study, across all five of the organizations, leaders identified teaching artists as the key to improving the quality of their arts programming. Next slide, please. The second cross-cutting lesson is that current and high quality equipment and materials are important for engaging youth in high quality visual and digital arts programs and maybe some performing arts programs. So YAI participation data shows that youth attended digital and visual arts programs more frequently when the classes featured high quality materials and equipment, such as computers, like new computers, paints, clay, et cetera. And in focus groups, YAI participants told us that they appreciated creating art with the new and high quality tools and really enjoyed it when they were offered choices of high quality materials or equipment. For instance, in visual arts classes, um, th that offered like um, like uh, like equipment for painting, equipment for sketching, equipment for molding. They appreciated these um, classes that had multiple opportunities over those that just featured one of the options. 
While the types of art that youth can produce in visual and digital art classes depends on the type of materials available, the need for high quality materials was a little bit less clear for the performing arts programs. Performing arts teaching artists that did not have high quality equipment or materials, such as those um, you know, in music classes that were using used instruments, for instance, or teaching artists in theater classes that were not using props, expressed that they thought the lack of quality equipment and materials was a deterrent to participation and engagement. And the last thing I'll say about that is the participation in dance programs was high no matter what the quality of the materials, the equipment, or the space. Next slide, please. So space is often a limited resource like money for OST organizations that offer multiple types of programs um, so that they can serve youth with many different interests. So creating a studio space for a single type of program like an art studio limits the space use. And that's not necessarily like aligned with the goals of, of multi-program OST organizations. Additionally, many multi-program OST organizations operate in schools or other um, public buildings such as recreation centers or public housing. Um, that, that where they can't easily modify those spaces. So four of the five organizations in this study made efforts to create an art studio in at least one of the sites, a site where they had control over the space. Um, they also offered YAI classes in existing multi-purpose rooms, some of which they made modifications to, such as painting the walls a bright inviting color or offering comfortable furniture, relaxation, or decorating the room with artwork. Um, to attract youth and convey that arts were important. But because they had limited space and aimed to provide lots of different types of programming, almost all of the spaces where YI happened were shared with other programs. When these spaces were shared or less than ideal studio spaces for the art form, um, it also narrowed the range of project and skills that could be taught. So for example, in visual arts projects that um, required like in-process artwork, to be left out to dry could not be conducted in those spaces that were shared um, because those materials then could be touched or moved. But if youth were being taught by a skilled teaching artist with um, high quality equipment and materials, we found that youth were engaged and that the teaching artist was able to implement the other principles. So those are the three high level cross organization findings. And now I wanna turn it over to Tracy, who's gonna talk more specifically about the approaches or some of the approaches that the organizations use to increase the quality of their arts programs with sustainability and scaling in mind. Next slide. And go, you can go to the next slide. Okay, so for each of the three infrastructure principles, we identified strategies that the clubs tried to, um, to implement these principles with, uh, you know, in ways that felt sustainable and scalable. So the first slide um, discusses how they approached hiring teaching artists. And you can see there are five slides there. These are five strategies that, that they used to be able to hire teaching artists in ways that they felt they could um, sustain the and retain these teaching artists. So I'm not going to speak to each of these per time uh, because of time, but I'm going to focus on the second one, um, employing early career teaching artists as well as professional um, teaching artists. So early career teaching artists were recent graduates or current students in an arts degree program in, in, in a discipline, uh, an art form. Most had not yet been paid for their artistic work or only had been paid on a limited basis. Um, but uh, actually fewer than one third of the artists that were hired across the initiative were early career artists. But in two cities, 80% or at least half of the teaching artists um, were early career artists. And in one city, 80% um, were uh, early career artists. So in some cities, um, the YI position, they found it they found it more appealing to early career artists and were able to hire more early career artists than professional practicing teaching artists. So what they learned um, in working with early career teaching artists 
Um, first, they learned that um, their artistic track record was not associated with the level of youth development skills they had. There were some early career artists who came in having very strong youth development skills, whereas others needed more support. But the same was true of professional practice and teaching artists. Many had youth development skills coming in, but some also still needed support in that area. Our observations also showed that early career artists were also able to offer skill development programming with high expectations. So their artistic training did enable them to offer those high expectations in the program. One um, disadvantage um, of working with early career artists was that they didn't have the professional networks or pro and portfolios that more experienced artists had and, and they couldn't model that full career trajectory of an artist yet but they still brought many um, strengths to the program. Um, in, and it was a promising model um, in thinking about how to hire large numbers of um, teaching artists. Next slide. The next um, set of approaches is, uh, describes the approaches that clubs used to providing high quality equipment and materials. So there were three strategies that emerged here. And I'm gonna focus again on the second one, which is purchasing a full set of materials and rotating them from site to site. Typically, um, teaching artists were responsible for rotating this equipment, but they were given a home base or storage location that they could store, you know, a, a location where they could store it. What clubs learned about this approach was that it was viable and it saved resources. And it also enabled more young people to have access to high quality equipment and materials. But on the other hand, it wasn't feasible for all art forms. Moving some of the electronic equipment or computers needed for digital arts was obviously difficult, sometimes impossible. And it also meant that youth did not have extended time with the materials to continue working on projects or experimenting with materials and equipment when the classes were not in session. Um, next slide. And the last set of approaches is around managing space constraints. So as Wendy said, um, the, the principle around space and creating high quality studio spaces was the most challenging principle for the clubs to implement. Um, and there were three different strategies that they used in um, managing and, and implementing this principle. And again, I'm gonna focus on the second uh, strategy, which was making use of neighborhood community arts partners or school art spaces. So some clubs were located in school buildings and were able to use school spaces after school. And in, this, um, in these situations, they were able to get access to the school's art room, their music room. Um, and in one instance, the uh, school had a digital music studio. And so the, the program was able to utilize these um, studio art spaces after school. Um, in another site, they were fortunate to have a community arts organization that was a short distance away, five minutes away, and they could transport youth to that facility. And the teaching artist from the club went with the young people to this space, and they were able to use a studio quality art space on a regular basis. However, one thing to consider um, for this strategy is the distance, because after school is a limited window of time. And so clubs were um, you know, conscious of not spending too much time trying to transport youth uh, to a space. So it had to be close, but in this case, it was a, a great um, option for finding high quality space for the program. The other, the other consideration was that staff were needed to accompany the youth. So there were extra um, sort of staff, staffing implications there. Um, and there was a trade-off that the club didn't have its own uh, high quality art space, which could be a draw for community members and for other donors that elevates the profile of the club as a, a provider of high quality arts. So there were some downsides, but it, it was definitely a viable strategy for making, uh, providing access to high quality art spaces. So that is the uh, conclusion of our presentation. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Amy Chico from the Knoxville Boys and Girls Club, who is uh, going to share her experience with the Youth Arts Initiative. Yeah, thanks, uh, Tracy and Wendy. Um, so our organization, Boys and Girls Club of the Tennessee Valley was one of the five sites that Wendy and Tracy were talking about to start the um, youth Arts Initiative Program. You can go ahead to the next slide. So just a little overview of um, my involvement with the youth 
Youth Arts Initiative Program with YI. Um, I was originally hired on to be a visual digital teaching artist. And in 2020, January 2020, um, I became director of the program. And then um, about late August, September of last year, I started getting into grant writing and um, doing some visual information design and storytelling for um, all of our programs across the organization. Next slide. So I always like to give a little formal overview of our program when I introduce it. Um, this is our blurb that uh, we usually share when um, introducing the program. I like it because it kind of expresses how big our program is. So we serve youth um, K through 12. And so we really have to adapt our classes um, to accommodate different age groups and skill levels. Uh, we also started from the beginning doing this part of it, which is um, offering a variety of art forms. There were some organizations and programs that uh, focused on one art discipline, like performing arts, but we really um, expanded and, and started by offering multiple art forms, and we are still doing that today. Next slide, please. So here's an overview of how our program has grown since the first year of implementation. Um, you can see that we have gone from serving 350 youth a year to a thousand. I think it's actually over a thousand um, now. And um, we also have um, over doubled the amount of club sites that we are now serving. We started with two full-time teaching artists and the others were part-time, but now all our artists are full-time. And um, we started with one community partner and we now have four uh, community partners that we work with and that teach uh, at our clubs every semester. Next slide, please. So I um, became director of the program in at the beginning of the pandemic in 2020 of January. Um, and I had not uh, led an arts program before. The program was very new and um, it was really overwhelming. And I really, I think um, we work in public service and, and direct service. I think it's important to remember why we chose this line of work, which is kind of what I had to go back to, which was, you know, what did I, what did my art program do for me when I was a kid and what did I need from it? Uh, next slide. And so I really used the um, 10 success principles that Wendy and Tracy were talking about to shape or to frame the program and to really uh, put together its core values and build the foundation. And I feel that they really worked together um, to shape the program. And it really wasn't just one or two that we leaned on, but it was really using them all collectively um, that, was, that we were able to make the program what it is. Next slide. So one of the first things I did when I became director of the program was make an opportunity for all our teaching artists to be full-time. Um, you know, I think we expect them to show up and meet the needs of our kids every day. And so it was really important to me that their needs were met as well so that they could show up as their best selves. And it really helped with our retention. And that allowed them to kind of build these relationships with our young people, um, not just for a semester, but um, for a year's time. And that's uh, Rhonda. Rhonda, um, was also a teaching artist that started the program and she's still working with our kids today. And I don't, um, I think that her being able to be full time and have that um, support and buy-in from our organization really is why she's still able to be there and, and working with our kids. Next slide. Um, gaining organization or gaining leadership um, support for our program was really important. We have a lot of organization-wide events, 
And we were asked to participate in them, whether it was to perform or to create art, um, to, to display or to um, give to funders and, and things like that. And um, at first it was kind of difficult to, you know, we have a lot of events, so like to meet those demands, but then I started to realize that um, our young people really liked them and it gave them an opportunity to, an extra opportunity to perform or to show off their artwork and I also think that that helped build buy-in with our leadership as well. So it ended up being kind of a win-win uh, for both sides. Next slide. So um, dedicated spaces was a tricky one. Um, clubs are, you know, all the rooms are multi-purpose a lot of the time, so it's not always possible. But the good thing about that was, was that we could schedule times for certain classes that um, were dedicated, that room was dedicated to that class. So, you know, even if it was being used for something else at a different time that, you know, our kids knew that at 3.30 on Tuesday that that room was going to be used for art. And so that kind of helped um, allow the clubs to still be able to use their spaces, but also allow us to kind of establish a home for our classes. Next slide. Um, so our kids, one of the things that I thought was really important, our kids have a lot to say in what programmings we run at what clubs. Um, they're really the ones that, that's how we decide which programs to run at particular clubs is what the kids want at that club site. And also they have a lot of say in um, the curriculum that we teach and what projects we do, what plays we put on. And it really helps them to get invested into the program and also just kind of raise expectations for themselves. And our programs, um, due to their success, we usually hold auditions for our performing arts programs. And so it really helped to um, raise the quality and expectations with our uh, students. Next slide. Showcases and performances were huge for our program. Uh, we started doing showcases and performances at the end of every semester in 2021 in the summer when the Tennessee Theater invited us to put on a performance, which we now do every summer. Um, we just had our third year of doing a performance there. And it really helps to show our program to the community and so that friends and family can come and, and be bought into the experience. But also, I think the most important thing is it gives our kids something to work for. And so they're not coming in and learning a dance. They're coming in, they know that they're going to be able to show their accomplishments at the end of each semester. Next slide. Um, this picture is one of my favorite pictures that's come out of the program. It was at our first Tennessee theater performance. And in the corner, you can see that's our theater teacher. And I feel like it just really embodies the relationships that are built in the program and just the peer support that comes from it. And um, this is not just unique to the theater program. This is like kind of the essence that we strive for um, to build in all of our classes. Next slide. This is um, Dominique. He was, he actually won our Youth of the Year YI Youth of the year, year last year. And he um, took part in every single one of our art forms that were offered uh, in my class. He really served as an assistant teacher. I really felt like he was my colleague at certain times because he would sit in there with me every single class. He would work with um, the other kids in the class. And um, he was just a huge support. Like, I don't know what I would have done without him. Um, it was so great to have him and just putting him in that leadership position, I could see did so much for him. And um, he, it really raised his self-confidence. I know that when he first started the program, he really was like kind of in the background. And then 
you know, he was the Tin Man in the show and like he was a star of one of our music videos. So like I could really see how much he grew through those leadership opportunities that he had. Next slide. Um, this is a picture from when we were shooting one of our music videos. That was actually a class that I taught uh, when I was a director. I don't, I'm not, like I don't have a background in that, but our kids really wanted to do something like that. And I'm kind of a tech person because I'm a designer. So I was like, oh, this can't be that hard. Well, it wasn't easy, but I learned with the kids. And I think that was a special experience for us. We made our beats from scratch and like, um every class we would like go through different instruments and like so we really got to learn how to do that together and I think there was just something really exciting about using technology in that way like it was just exciting to have that technology and and like those lights like that's actually set up in um uh, a garage of a production studio like it's their back studio it's like not even like a a professional space but we really like made it something special and um put up those lights and and you know it's it's not just um it it was special for them because it's like something that's familiar to them because they're so used to using technology in all aspects of their life but also um just kind of taking it to the next level next slide um, so we have a lot of, we have four contracted teaching artists that we work with right now. Um, they're community art initiatives. This is a picture of our spring performance. Um, we work with an initiative called, um, Drums Up, Guns Down, and they're already working with our kids in the community. So they know them. And so then they're coming into their clubs and able to work with them even further, uh, after school. And it also, you know, there's only four full-time teaching artists. So it really gives our kids more programs to choose from and working with other artists and other community members that they are familiar with in their community. Next slide. Um, this is a picture of Jackson. It's also one of my favorite pictures. Um, it's out of one of our performances, but like he looked like that in class too, all the time. Uh, he was kind of quirky and I feel like Sometimes that didn't go over for him so well, like in the, the club setting, but he was like kind of admired for it in YI because he just felt it so much. And I think just like seeing that the program gave him the space to be appreciated and celebrated for who he was, was really special. Next slide. Um, I wanna end with this quote from one of our students. And I think that this is really at the core what the program is about. It's about giving our kids a space to take risks and face their fears just for the purpose of learning about themselves and then building that confidence in themselves um, to see that really uh, all they really need to be is themselves and and to celebrate that and and be celebrated for that um and i am going to turn it over to sean thanks so much amy it's very inspiring to see <laughs> i'm sorry what the ya program can do for um young um like artists who don't even like know that they want to be artists um, I do want to take a moment just to share with you some program tools that the After School Alliance has available. Um, and then I'll turn it over to Tiffany Walker, who is um, a research and evaluation specialist at the Forum for Youth Investment. Um, and then we'll close it out with a few questions from the audience. <clears throat> Excuse me. The After School Alliance um, has a program toolbox and it's designed for after school and summer providers. Whether you're starting an after school program or if you are continual, if you already have one and regardless of how long it's been running, um, these has a variety, this to toolbox has a variety of guides, tools, case studies, and best practices from out of school time experts and organizations. Our program toolbox is an invaluable resource for all after school program providers. It's divided into four sections. 
um, to explore the resources the best way that can fit your needs. So the first section is um, a starting a program. If you're looking at to start an after school program in your community, we have all the tools that you'll need. Get off to the start of strong start with a um, startup guide from various state networks and maps. Map out your curriculum with the list of the best practices for different age groups that you'll be serving. Um, investing in your after school staff and management can help ensure a strong and successful um, program. So be sure to take a look at the practitioner's guide, the training toolkits, and the after school research to help uh, you get started in the development of your program. Down at the bottom of these um, slides is a QR code for you to take a photo of. It should go directly to the program toolbox and as well as a short link for the program toolbox. Um, a next portion of the toolbox is running a program. Um, running a program means uh, keeping up with all the moving parts and the needs of the students, staff, and the community. Um, we include in our running a program section um, case studies and community specific specific programs examples, and they offer a look into how after-school programs are serving different communities from rural to urban and to native populations. Um, here you can also take a deep dive into what makes a high quality after-school program with 15 years of after-school research, issue briefs, and principles of expanded learning. The next section of our toolkit includes like a sustaining a program section that includes um, uh, a funding database, a funding toolkit, online tutorials, and other case, case studies that can help guide your efforts to sustain your program. Um, and we also include marketing and media tools uh, that are available to help evaluate your program and build support for your community. Uh, the last portion of the resource guide is our the program toolkit is um, a getting help section. Um, our program toolbox offers a lot of access to state, sorry, it offers access to state networks and it, they are here to help you stay updated on all things after school in your state. Um, you can find your state, your local funding information, um, facts and figures about how children in your state spend their time after hours after school in our um, toolbox uh, toolkit. Uh, resources in this section also include a list of professional development opportunities and conferences from out of school times and organizations. Um, and with that, I will stop my screen share and I will turn it over to Tiffany. Um, again, she is a research evaluation specialist in the forum from the forum from Youth Investment. Tiffany. Cool. Thank you, Sean. So I will highlight our organization's website, forumfyi.org, and our knowledge center on that site. So there are several reports and briefs that are focused on a variety of topics like program quality, partnerships, and staff development. So a lot of those resources will be a complement to what the After School Alliance has shared and the report that was discussed today. Um, one report I'll lift up that was published a couple years ago is called Design Principles for Community-Based Settings. Uh, putting the science of learning and development into action. So this report really discusses implementation strategies for creating positive developmental relationships and environments that generally support young people. So I think that report would be a nice complement to the report um, that we previewed today. And I would invite you to check out that resource. I think that link is in the chat or will be in the chat. And then I'll also highlight our team has been working with researchers from the University of Pittsburgh School of Education. So Dr. Asohe Osai and Dr. Tom Akiva on a research study. Um, it's been a little over a year now, and that study is focused on understanding how culture-centered community-based arts organizations or programs that intentionally serve youth of color support well-being. So at this point, we've worked with close to 40 programs across eight different US cities, and we've collected data from young people, teaching artists, and program and community leaders. And I have to say, like what I saw while visiting some of these programs really does align with the design principles that Dr. Hartman and Dr. McClanahan have described in their report. 
um, really the principles around dedicated and welcoming spaces and affirming young people as artists. So we are really excited as we wrap up the data collection phase to move into the data analysis portion of our work. Um, we're looking forward to sharing what we learned that'll be later in 2024. So if you are interested in that research and just keeping up with what the forum is doing, um, I'll invite you to connect with us through our newsletter, Forum FYI, and I believe that link should be in the chat. And I will hand it back over to Sean for our Q&A portion. Thank you so much, Tiffany. First off, I want to thank um, Tracy, Wendy, Amy, and you, Tiffany, for joining us today and being able to talk to our participants about um, programs after school and the um, study. Uh, we do have a few questions from the audience and feel free if you have questions to just drop them in the chat and we'll uh, get to them. So this question is directly for the research team. Um, how many total waves of study were conducted and are there more waves coming in the future? There were two waves. The, the first wave focused on three cities um, and uh, they were, uh, that was the initial pilot where they um, implemented the 10 principles and demonstrated that it could be done in an organization like Boys and Girls Clubs that's, that has multiple types of programs. And then this second wave was with five cities and they were trying to test and develop models that were sustainable and scalable. And in terms of up, upcoming waves, um, at, at that, that question, I don't have the answer to, <laughs> but um, the, you might ask the Wallace Foundation. We can always put the um, email to like the general uh, Wallace um, uh, website on in the chat as well, if folks want to reach out to them directly <laughs> for that answer. Okay, this is another question for the research team. Um, granted that they that uh, there were development, sorry, granted that these were developed for specific program types. Are there any principles from the 10 principles for evaluating programs quality that you consider applicable to non-arts programs? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, one of the things that we learned, uh, I would say in both in all of our research on the Youth Arts Initiative, but particularly in that first um, uh, study that was Trace, Tracy was talking about with three clubs, is that um, the leaders of organizations did begin to see how um, all of the 10 principles could apply to other types of out of school time programming that they were doing. So for example, when we started the work, we always thought, and I think it is to some extent true, but we thought like the first um, five principles are more art specific and the last five are more youth development specific or general, more youth development general. But really, you know, there's an argument to be made about, um, and I think OST programs do that is in some domains that, you know, experts, for example, principal one teaching artists could be applied in other areas of programming. So you could have, um, and, and do have like often teachers come in and um, provide uh, programming and out of school time. Um, or it could be if you're, um, I don't know, if you're doing, lacrosse, maybe you have a lacrosse expert come in and teach that class. So, um, and the same thing, you can imagine um, how other programs um, could really end with culminating events. So so I, I think that the 10 principles um, can be applied more broadly in out of school time programs. And I think that what, again, what we heard from leaders is that they were beginning to envision and experiment with ways that they could apply those 10 principles in other types of programming. Amazing. I have a question here for Amy. Um, so your program is so inspiring. Has support from the club's executive leadership board and donors grown or evolved in a way as they have seen the success of the program? Oh, definitely. Um, I think when we first brought the program into the clubs, it was um, not as well received as we would have hoped. 
it was just something different and not something that they were used to and and it just operated differently um and i think one of the most important things that we did were we really tried to include club leadership um into our program and and also organization leadership by being a part of those events and not you know just like being this program but the program being a part of uh you know the big picture too and um when we have our big events uh and we have club staff that come and participate and help um with our kids we deck them out in our yi stuff and like we really want them to be a part of what we're doing because it wouldn't be possible without them and so i think it's just really um wanting being open to uh letting them be a part of the decision making and letting them in and that's really what has done so much for our program and it being well received by others. Another question for you, Amy. <laughs> Excuse me. Were there were there any partners you worked with in your program? Um or and do you have any advice for connecting with partners in the programs community? Yeah. Um we uh are are you talking like community partners just in general yeah so we yeah. have a lot of oh, yes. okay yeah we have a lot of community partners that we work with now some of them um we have four that are consistent that work with us every semester and then we have some that will come in for workshops or just for a semester um and i think that at first we had some trouble finding those people but once we started doing our performances, they started coming to us and we're like, hey, we're doing, we teach dance or like our um, drums up, guns down uh, teacher was like, hey, I do this um, drum class and they really want to be a part of it. And so then we're, they're able to support our program and our kids and we're also able to support them. And then it kind of just meshes together all these community art initiatives and it's really a beautiful thing. Amazing. Um, Tracy and Wendy, a lot of folks are asking about the link to the report. I think the link that was put in the chat is going to a non-working um, link. So we'll put another chat or we'll put another link in there just to make sure that everyone has access. <laughs> access to the research. Um, and then Tiffany, I have a question for you. Uh, do you see an overlap between the 10 principles outlined for high quality arts programming and the design for principles for community-based settings? Yeah, there's definitely some overlap with those principles. I think when you think about um, those developmental relationships that are important. So you think about teaching artists, really connecting with young people and affirming them. You would want that to happen in general, youth-based arts programs. So yeah, there's definitely an overlap. Um, and I would encourage folks to check that resource out. I think we have another time. Some enough time for maybe one or two more questions. So I do have one more question for the research team, Wendy and Tracy. Um, is why I arts for arts sake, not a paired and not paired with SEL or multidisciplinary learning? And are there enough funds to sustain this? That's a great question. Um, I'll, I'll answer the easier of the two. <laughs> Let Tracy answer the second one. Um, uh, I think that there, there certainly, we know there are benefits, uh, social emotional learning benefits to art, but YAI is developed as like, I'll say like an art first program. It is an art program to teach young people art skills. That is the, that is the goal. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of whether it's sustainable, I think, you know, our, um, research, like, you know, what we learned through the research on YI and the experiences of Boys and Girls Clubs of America and the clubs and um, was that uh, it is to, to implement all of the principles um, fully is often can be hard to do in a resource constrained environment like, um, you know, which, which is often what 
uh, OST programs that offer multiple different types of programs to, you know, opportunities to young people, that's often how they operate and, you know, with fewer resources than they would like. So it is hard um, to sustain those programs. I think um, that we have not had an opportunity to, you know, really answer that question with research, like to, with study to go see um, the extent to which or what pieces have been sustained. But we do know that even among the first three clubs that implemented YAI, that to some extent in at least some of those clubs, there are still elements of YAI that are happening. So that is what I will say, and I'll see if Tracy has anything to add. Yeah, I mean, I think that Amy's story also shows that, you know, this ended in 2021 and their program is still mm -hmm. going and it has grown. So it does seem like um, it's sustainable. I was excited to hear that the teaching artists are now full time. Like that's, uh, you know, that's unusual in out of school time to have full time staff uh, like that. So I think that's wonderful. And so I think that's a good example of how things are are being sustained. And the last thing I will say, just a shameless plug for, for the report, is that I think, you know, the goal of setting the stage is like, here are some of the things that that these organizations tried to make this higher quality mm -hmm. art skill development opportunities available to a larger spot of young people. I just wanted to say, speak on that. Um, one of the ways that we have been sustainable, like our sustainability really um, stemmed from us getting ourselves out there with those showcases and like getting out into the community so that they really see like, you know, like their, their kids are on stage, like, you know, singing in Cinderella and like, they're really seeing these outcomes from the program. So sustainability, um, I think it really uh, relies heavily on your ability to to put yourself out there and to really like hustle for those situations and those opportunities um, to perform and, and be a part of the community. And that's kind of like what I was saying with the leadership is like, you know, whenever someone asks you to, to, oh, you know, do you want to be a part of this? Like the answer is yes, especially in those early stages, because it really helps build those relationships and set you up for success um, and sustainability down the line. Amazing. And with that, it is 4 p.m. I do want to thank you again, Tracy, Wendy, Amy, and Tiffany for having this wonderful conversation. Um, <clears throat> all the participants for coming. We'll be sure to have a recording of the link. I'm sorry, the recording of the webinar and links to the research. Um, uh, shortly after the webinar has been posted. And if you guys want to get in touch with any of our speakers today, feel free to email us. We can put you in touch with them. Or if our speakers want to put their emails in the chat, they're very welcome to for our participants to reach out and have or ask any other questions that you have um, going forward. Thanks again and have a wonderful, wonderful evening.